Um, I'm about to uh, uh, introduce our fantastic speaker um, in, in a moment, but I, before I do that, may I just uh, remind all of you uh, of the importance of Justice, the uh, Law Reform and Human Rights Organisation, which I hope many of you on the uh, on the call on the at the conference on the core conference um, support already. As you know, um, these are critical times both for the justice system and indeed for the for the rule of law. Um, and so I hope you agree with us that there is a real need for a strong, uh, trusted independent, innovative voice um, uh, from the profession and, and, and beyond on how the system should and could work differently. Um, as you may have just heard, we've, we've just finished our um, uh, annual um, uh, general meeting, our AGM, uh, and whilst we've achieved a huge amount over the last year, um, there are still many, many more challenges to come, and we uh, we really um, encourage those of you who don't already, or who aren't already members, uh, who who would like to support us or know more about what we do, uh, to uh, get in touch, have a look at our website, speak to our members, speak to others who you know and support us, and learn more. Um, and if you are a member, um, please or a friend, please continue donating and 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 continue to share with your colleagues and friends um, the the good work. Um, thank you so much again for attending this evening. Um, I'm. I'm going to uh, uh, now move us on to uh, introducing our, uh, our fantastic lecturer um, and just say one word about the Tom Sargent Memorial um, uh, lecture and, and how it came about. Tom was our our first secretary, so that's the equivalent of, of my role today, the chief exec, um, and from its foundation in 1957 to his retirement in 1982, he took a keen interest um, in this charity. He was a pioneer uh, in the cause of miscarriage of justice and he led justice and made it uh, his uh, made his early mark on the infrastructure of our, of our justice system. Uh, this year's lecture is entitled Making the Law Work for Women, Solutions to Extreme Misogyny, uh, and is going to be delivered by Dr. Anne Olivaria. Uh, KC, honorary uh, and OBE. Um, there may be a little time at the end of the lecture um, and if there is we will use the online Q&A fun Q function um, uh, but I, I know that uh, well I'm very much looking forward to what Anne has to say and just to say a little bit about um, Anne. She is the chair of the executive committee of McAllister uh, Olivarius, uh, an international law firm specialising in cases of sexual misconduct and discrimination. As a campaigner, she has had significant influence on the laws of England and Wales, from lobbying Parliament to pass criminal laws against non-consensual sensual pornography, uh, to helping push the landmark UK domestic abuse bill uh, through. She has also been a, a amongst the most influential figures in changing the way in which UK universities respond to students who have been sexually harassed or assaulted. As a practicing lawyer, she's achieved landmark settlements for survivors of abuse, including bringing the first ever civil claim against a Jehovah's Witness for child abuse and the first civil case for uh, over non-consensual pornography in England and Wales. Anne, very much looking forward to this. Over to you. It's a great pleasure to be speaking to you this evening. I want to begin my remarks with a line from Magna Carta that stayed with me since law school. Clause 40, the shortest one. To no one will we sell, to no one deny or delay, right or justice. What a model of constitutional exposition. Brief, pungent, inspiring. But then, what do we do next? How do we accomplish the ideal of justice proclaimed in these few words? We know pretty well what it means to sell justice and why that's bad. But how do we, how do others know when we have been denied right or justice? Just because we didn't get what we want? When is a delay good due process? And when is it malign? Who is the we doing these sales? Delays and denials, and by what authority do we become the we dispensing? the justice. No matter what the animating principles, it is clear that a system of law is required to give meaning and effect to any idea of justice. It was in 1895 that Professor A. V. Dicey coined the term the rule of law. His definition was more practical than Magna Carta. He thought the rule of law encompassed three things. First, that nobody is punishable until a breach of law is established before the courts. 
Second, that nobody is above the law and all are subject to the same law administered in the same courts. And third, that the slow incremental process of common law decision-making, judge by judge, case by case, is the fairest system of administering justice. The fundamental principle he wrote is that every man, whatever be his rank or condition, is subject to the ordinary law of the realm and amenable to the jurisdiction of the ordinary tribunals. Professor Dicey's conception is a crucial bedrock of the Anglo-American legal system, and even, I contend, integral to British national identity. The patient, steady expansion of the common law has many modern add-ons he did not foresee, from transnational codes of human rights to judicial review to a Supreme Court, but it is still central to what makes Britain endure and admirable. That idea of an ever-improving rule of law was Tom Sargent's life work. He was anything but complacent. He was a thoroughly decent man who cared about people and fairness. He cared about the legal system being a tool for good, and he cared about his country. My proposition for this evening is that we are in a crisis of the rule of law, one so omnipresent that it is mostly taken for granted, certainly no occasion for panic, just part of the way things are. Let me describe that quiet crisis directly. The law still treats women as an underclass. Women's rights are lesser, contingent, often ignored. No system is perfect, inequality hobbles many groups, and certainly there has been substantial progress in the rights and freedoms of women in my lifetime. But looking back now, age 68, what strikes me in 2023 is how distant a goal of equality between the sexes seems compared to the near certainty of achieving and achieving that that I and others anticipated two generations ago when the major laws prescribing equal treatment of men and women in multiple spheres were enacted. I raise this subject not just because I am a woman, but because it is also has implications for how well our society and political system are working. I've made my home in Britain for 25 years. You have been kind enough to accept me and my family as citizens, and I love it here and want Britain to be its best. The reality is that too often, women are still treated as undeserving of justice and powerful men are treated as above the law. As long as this is the case, the rule of law is just an ideal, not being achieved for 51% of the population. Do I detect, even through the zoom lens, people shifting uncomfortably in their seats? Are you now sentenced to spend the next hour listening to a rant from a feminazi? on a topic that is both unpleasant and somehow all too familiar. I hope that turns out not to be the case or your conclusion. My own frustration at our lack of progress is objectively grounded. Let me set the stage to bring under the spotlight for closer examination a few of the many indications that first, women are not equal under the law, and second, that this condition is so omnipresent as to be almost unnoticed unacknowledged on some theoretical level, but not acted upon. Even many women seem to accept this inequality as an inevitable condition of life. Of course, this is a problem that goes far beyond the law. As Helena Kennedy put it in her wonderful book, Miss Justice. For millennia, women have been made to feel shame. They have been told that what happens to them is their fault and it is they who are blamed for their failures, their shortcomings, their conduct. Women are made to feel soiled. They absorb feelings of guilt. The voice in their heads is mouthing cultural norms created by men and sold to women. It must have been something about me that made him do that to me. Let's begin at the harsh end of the spectrum. Between 2009 and 2018, men murdered 1,435 women in the United Kingdom. In only 8% of the cases was the murderer a stranger. 
8%. In 62% of the cases, the spouse, partner, or former partner did it. And in two thirds of those cases, there was a history of prior abuse. Lights were flashing. These partners were clearly abusing their future murder victims in plain sight in ways that raised alarms. But the legal system could not perceive the problem in time to divert the impending crash. The rule of law here was literally a dead letter. Rape and sexual assault are at epidemic levels. In the 12 months ending September 2021, the police recorded 171,000 sexual offenses, the highest on record, of which 63,136 were rapes. Last year, that record was broken again, more than 67,000 rapes. By the end of the year, fewer than 2% had resulted in a charge, only 2%. Survey data show that approximately one in four women in Britain and the United States has been raped or sexually assaulted as an adult. And more than one third of British university students are sexually assaulted or raped. These are crimes of violence and violation with serious consequences for many of their victims and they are occurring on a vast scale. Most experts believe that rapes are vastly underreported, so the figures I've quoted you are probably not actually true. They're under reports. People don't like to talk about rape. It remains painful, private, the woman's fault, wrapped in a social taboo that prevents us from seeing it clearly. I was strangled and raped during my second year at Yale. A male friend I had known for a year, who knew my boyfriend well, saw a movie with me, then came back to my dormitory room for a cup of tea and told me a compelling story about how he hated his mother and father, who were a terrible burden to him. He felt lonely and did not want to be by himself that night and asked if he could stay. Trusting as I then was, I said yes, but still went to sleep fully clothed with trousers and underwear. There was no alcohol, there were no drugs, no kissing, and no hint of attraction. Just as dawn was breaking, he climbed on top of me, choking me so I could not breathe, yanking my trousers and underwear off, drooling on me inside of me. I later had bruises from how he squeezed my neck and blood from the rough penetration. I spent the rest of the night quietly sobbing. He left the next morning as if nothing had happened. When I called the police, they would do nothing because in those days, white Yale men got a lot of leeway. And after all, I had allowed him into my bed. The deans would do nothing. It was a free crime. The alleged rule of law rubbed up against social reality and lost. There has been progress in the last 40 years but this is still an area of human violation and misery that the law does not consistently or effectively reach, despite being vast and all around us. As an aside, my rapist is now a prominent doctor at the University of California in Davis, who denied it all and called me mentally deranged for raising these memories with him years later. He made a medical diagnosis that was improper because I was not his patient and he did not examine me. So I filed a complaint with the California Medical Board for his violation of professional ethics. The board refused to do anything, but the ensuing publicity definitely made him accountable at UC Davis and was at least some measure of justice. I received hundreds of direct replies on social media to my post describing the rape. Only one said it was, he said, she said. All the rest recognized I was telling the truth. Many reported similar experiences. A few knew and had worked with my rapist, Dr. Calvin Hirsch at UC Davis, and said they had found him denigrating of women doctors, self-entitled, and a highly unpleasant man. I talk about rape hoping it will help other women realize they're not alone. In fact, I would like to start a website where other rape victims can post their stories and name their rapists, which presents some interesting challenges in terms of defamation law. But the fact is that almost every woman I know well enough to have an honest conversation with, and that includes many young women, has been sexually assaulted or raped. 
I was at a meeting of a working group on the online harms bill, which included MPs and members of the House of Lords, four of whom had been raped out of the four women present, I should say, one repeatedly. None had told their husbands or partners. None of the men present, MPs, said they knew anyone who had been raped. My point, men are not aware of the extent of this problem. The reticence stems in part from knowing that the legal system has often viewed rape as a vehicle for judging the character of the woman involved, at least as much as the behavior of the man. Baroness Kennedy mentions a 1991 judgment by Mr. Justice Alliott in her book, Eve Was Framed. He gave a rapist a three-year sentence despite the recommended minimum of five because his victim was a common prostitute and a whore. He believed that while every woman is entitled to complain about being violated, someone who for years has flaunted their body and sold it cannot complain as loudly as someone who has not. These attitudes are one reason why rape is a plague bigger than COVID, and there's no jab for it. The rule of law lies adjacent to it, only tangentially important. Because by and large, the rapists are not in prison. The perpetrators generally go on to lead untrammeled lives, successful in their careers with all the trimmings, CEOs, MPs, senior police officers, university vice presidents, famous TV presenters, even presidents of the United States. Donald Trump was found guilty by a jury of sexually assaulting E. Jean Carroll and previously bragged that he could get away with grabbing women by the pussy because he was famous. And he will almost certainly be the presidential nominee of a political party that proclaims itself the voice of law and order. Or consider another showman, Andrew Tate. He was kicked off a reality TV series, Big Brother, in 2016, when a video surfaced of him striking a woman with a belt and telling her he would fucking kill her if she texted another man. He has admitted to hitting a woman and breaking her jaw. After that, he became a huge online influencer, amassing over 11 billion views on TikTok before being banned. Nearly half of young men in this country approve of him based on a lifestyle of luxury and hyper-masculinity that treats women with contempt and violence. It is a statistical fact that young men are more likely in Britain to have heard of him than Rishi Sunak. Tate says that women belong to the man and that they should bear some responsibility for being raped. He asked before being charged for rape and human trafficking in January, how can I use these women to make me money? And I'm not a rapist, but I like the idea of just being able to do what I want. I like being free. The prospect of going to jail in Romania where he faces charges has not dented his huge popularity. The internet makes it easier for him and other proponents of toxic behaviors of all kinds, including toxic masculinity, to find each other and then proselytize a social and technical phenomenon that the rule of law has not begun to come to terms with. In my legal practice, I hear multiple stories of sexual assault and equally important in terms of women's daily life and livelihood of a constant need to be vigilant against it, to manage the men who threaten it, to mollify and flatter and sidestep, and hope against hope that uncomfortable situations will not escalate. Here are typical stories of my clients. I have an up and coming executive, top performer her entire life, loving her work and her company. Suddenly she must choose whether to sleep with the boss or step into the void. And the void almost always turns out to be demotion, sidetracking, the upward trajectory stopped. Even if a legal case can bring her some money, which we often can accomplish, she might have to pivot to a new job, maybe a new field. Many women have no interest in fighting a battle like this. They did not choose. They did not encourage. And the legal system is irrelevant unless someone is willing to become a claimant and pay the price of using it. Another recent example, the graduate student in a competitive field dependent to an almost medieval guild degree on the good opinion of her supervisor. And he flirts and talks about sex and brings his sexual partners to give papers in the department. 
and makes it clear in a thousand ways that whatever her brain can do is of secondary interest. In one case, we brought against the University of Rochester in New York, we had affidavits from 17 women who changed their life paths to avoid such a professor, dropping classes he was best equipped to teach or changing the focus of their dissertation to avoid him or changing departments or leaving with a master's degree instead of the full doctorate or dropping out of academia altogether. He was a boy genius, allegedly, and his supporters said we thwarted his wonderful talent by bringing this case. But how many wonderful female talents, how many girl geniuses were thwarted by his constant uninvited sexual aggression? No one seems to wonder about that. In another case, this client felt incredibly gratified to get a job at a firm run by a world leader in his field, a knight of the British realm, regularly on magazine covers, but his firm kept her passport while it allegedly got her a visa, paid her a weekly pittance via cash in an envelope that stretched for months and then years. Then one night after a business meeting, she has a drink with him and finds that her limbs don't work and he is having sex with her. She was roofied by a man who could have sex with many women, not his wife, just by asking. The idea that it would be pleasurable to have sex with someone you have incapacitated is beyond me, but it illustrates the dark side of a desire to dominate and even humiliate that shows up all too often in the stories of my clients. This man told her afterwards, quote, I fuck who I need to get ahead. And he has hired leading lawyers and crisis PR firms to protect him. We represented the women at Warwick University who discovered their male classmates had a private chat group where the lads gave their unvarnished views. Rape the whole flat to teach them a lesson, one message read. Another, it's fun to just go wild and rape a hundred girls. And she looks like a rape victim after one woman reported a sexual assault to the police. Another message said, she's simply not attractive enough for that to happen to her. These boys embody trends the internet has accelerated, a coarsening of discourse, a willingness to pour scorn and invective on people not present using your thumbs. The internet is also where young people learn about sex. Survey data show that one in three boys sees hardcore porn by the age of 12. 88% of porn scenes contain violent images and an estimated 1 billion young people are exposed every year to porn. This is modern British sex education. One of my children's university friends described a sexual encounter with a very nice young man who had not, uh, he told her that he didn't have very much sexual experience. As they got going in bed, he started choking her. She was horrified and said, what are you doing? And he said, oh, I thought that's how you're supposed to do it. I'm so glad. I didn't want to do that either, but it's what Red Tube had taught him. Nothing about real sex and mutual pleasure, just aggression and degradation towards women. And before I move on from this parade of horribles to analyzing causes and solutions, let me go down to the scale of severity to some of the daily minor reminders that women are considered lesser beings that I think many women here will recognize as part of the air we breathe. Here are four recent examples from the fine website, Everyday Sexism, created by Laura Bates. And there are tens of thousands more. Some of them, the rule of law might possibly reach, but mostly not. Kirsten said, was on the tram. A man hemmed me into the corner of the seat. I thought that would be it. Then he put his hand down my trousers and into my pants. I froze and couldn't even speak. It was only when the tram stopped, I got myself up and ran away. I'm angry at myself for not doing anything than I am at him. In fact, survey data show that 71% of British women of all ages have experienced sexual harassment in a public place. That's 71%. And that percentage is higher for younger women. Jessica wrote, I was in a meeting at work. My male colleague spent 40 minutes of the hour long meeting explaining to a female researcher in engineering how her own invention worked. That same colleague messages me in meetings to explain words he thinks I don't understand. Another woman, Ginny said, 
I own and run a manufacturing business and attend trade shows with my husband. He is not involved in the business in any other way than as a sounding board for me and my ideas. 90% of the time, male exhibitors will ignore me and talk to him about my business, even though I introduce myself as the owner of the business. I ask them questions and answer theirs, and my business cards only have my name and details on them. I then receive follow-up emails from these salesmen to my email address with his name as the recipient. This last example hits close to home for me. I started my own law firm. My husband joined 10 years later after being the bureau chief of Time Magazine in London. Many people have told me how nice my husband is to let me work for him. Office of National Statistics data show that two out of three women aged 16 to 34 have experienced some form of harassment in the previous 12 months. 44% of women aged 16 to 34 experienced calf calls, whistles, unwanted sexual comments, or jokes. All this anti-female behavior is on a continuum. Murdering your wife because she has the effrontery to leave you. Roofing and raping your classmate because you think she deserves it are the bigger, bolder cousins of mansplaining at a meeting or telling a girl she's not smart enough to do maths. All of it is founded on the assumption that women are inferior. So what does the rule of law mean in dealing with social attitudes so ingrained? If the problem is not even seen as a legal problem, Dicey's vision of a legal playing field with neutral referees consistently applying clear rules is a powerful and important one. Without it, there is no legal system, just arbitrary power. Of course, there has been substantial progress for women in my lifetime. What is holding up more and faster delivery of greater equality under the law for women? That's the question. For the harsh ends of the continuum I have described, we do have laws that seek to constrain and punish misconduct, such as murder and rape, and more recently, sexual harassment, historic sex abuse, and employment discrimination. Police, prosecutors, even civil lawyers like me work every day at exporting the rule of law to this outlaw territory. Why do we have so much more work to do? One important reason is that the institutions responsible for delivering the law in practice lack capacity. Justice's own 2019 report, Prosecuting Sexual Offenses, did an excellent job showing the strains on every element of the system, and mostly things have gotten worse. Remarkably, this country now lacks sufficient infrastructure to penalize offenders. Last month, the prison population reached 88,016, just 654 below the total capacity of 88,670. Two-thirds of prisons are officially overcrowded, and there are plenty of news stories about longtime prison officers quitting because conditions are so dispiriting. Justice Secretary Alex Chalk, KC, announced at the Conservative Party conference in October that the government was even in talks with Estonia and Norway about renting prison spaces. And on top of this, the Crown Courts have a backlog of almost 63,000 cases. What could be a greater signal that we lack confidence in the rule of law than instructing judges to refrain from sending those charged with serious crimes to prison on remand before their trials, or not to give rapists custodial sentences, or to delay them if convicted? A reminder of that declaration from 808 years ago, to no one will we delay right or justice. The justice system has been an easy place for spending cuts to accumulate. Courts closing, criminal barristers making less than the minimum wage, legal aid drained, prisons allowed to run down. As the American jurist Oliver Wendell Holmes Jr. said, taxes are the price of civilization and public institutions that are worthy of trust require steady funding and support from the political system. In addition, to recommend something that won't cost taxpayers anything, I suggest revitalizing the civil justice system. Civil lawyers add firepower to the criminal system. They have vindicated women's rights in the employment tribunal or in the civil courts against perpetrators of harassment, image-based abuse, or actual sexual abuse. We can sometimes represent people after criminal statutes and limitations have expired. We can get survivors compensation and be more attuned to client needs than the police. 
claimant lawyers can be an important force for vindicating individual rights, as we have seen with the post office scandal, the unanimous Supreme Court decision that Boris Johnson's proroguing of Parliament was unlawful, the years of litigation over phone hacking by the tabloids, among scores of other cases. Of all the organizations in the country that repeatedly prove this, justice is at the top. And I want to say now how much I admire your work. For my work representing survivors of child sexual abuse, I would argue that plaintiff's lawyers in the United States, particularly Jeff Anderson in Minnesota, combined with the newspapers, did more to break open the scandal of abuse in the Catholic Church than any other force except survivors themselves. That fight took decades, received powerful help from newspapers, and was fueled by archival research around the globe developing a core of experts and repeated knockdown, drag out litigation up to the appellate level and down and up again to pry documents out of the secret files maintained in every diocese, which the lawyers could afford because they made money through large contingency fees based on substantial awards for pain and suffering, which are not artificially limited as they are here. In terms of creating incentives, for lawyers and litigants to plunge into the miseries of a lawsuit that can vindicate rights the criminal justice system has failed to, I simply point out that a child sex abuse case that in this country will merit damages of say 100,000 pounds, which is hard to accomplish here, will easily on the same facts get typically $5 million in California. And firms like mine on a good day can get 30 to 40% of that which we plow back into other tough but less profitable cases. I've been tempted to commission a TV ad in this country showing a group of cardinals and bishops deciding what to do with a pedophile priest. And the punchline would be, I know, let's send him to Britain. No matter how much harm he does there, he won't cost us much. But back to public institutions, the police are clearly struggling. They are being given more new laws to enforce. Even police numbers are just now getting back to the level of 10 years ago after a 15% decline. In many cases, they appear to be overwhelmed from small burglaries to the epidemic of internet fraud and to crimes affecting women too. For example, we have many women coming to us with storage of image-based sexual abuse. This is typically when a former boyfriend has posted an intimate picture to get revenge or has put it on a porn site for kicks or sent it to friends who do the same. Sharing intimate pictures is now firmly established as part of dating rituals in the smartphone age. And once an image is spread beyond its intended recipient, it can be infinitely replicated and is essentially permanent. The UK sees about 4,000 cases a year reported to the police, under 10% of which are charged. Survey data suggests that the real numbers of such incidents is in the hundreds of thousands per year posting intimate images with the intent to cause distress to the person depicted has been illegal since 2013, carrying a two-year prison sentence. Between 2015 and 2021, 28,201 offenses were recorded out of those millions of instances. Only 6.2% resulted in a charge or summons. A Freedom of Information request filed in 2019 to all 43 UK police forces found that police cited a lack of public interest for the low number of charges. The Met was among 12 forces which declined to provide any information. We have directed clients to the police many times for this offense. In all but one case, the police were just not interested. They are overwhelmed with crimes they consider more pressing. So my first positive suggestion for change, substantially more resources consistently applied for the justice system, judges, prosecutors, court buildings and IT, court staff, police, defense lawyers, legal aid from top to bottom. Of course, it's not just resources, it's the attitudes of the people using them. After the shock of Met Police Officer Wayne Cousins murdering Sarah Everard, and then David Garrick admitting to 49 crimes, including 24 rapes over an 18 year period, we were perhaps not shocked that the Met then announced it needed to review 1,633 cases of alleged domestic violence and sex crimes involving over a thousand police officers and staff. 
Many press stories document male police chat groups sharing rape fantasies, casual scorn for women, and enthusiasm for violence. I take Sir Mark Rowley at his word that he intends to clear the Met of this poison. Current law does not permit positive discrimination in favor of women, such as quotas, only positive action to encourage recruitment. In publicly significant institutions like the police with well-documented cultures of misogyny, I would favor legislation to permit quotas. If police were mostly women, mostly women, it would be a very difficult to establish a toxic culture in which cousins, Carrick, and other dangerous figures have been able to prosper and continue at the Met and other police officers, other police departments. Serious regular training, including engagement with civilian critics, not just a test taken on a computer, should also work to keep police, who very naturally can retreat into an us versus them worldview, aware that their job is not just to enforce authority, but to uphold a broader rule of law. The internet is such a huge and multi-headed force, changing faster than regulators can even understand it now drinking in rocket fuel in the form of artificial intelligence that I have to put it close to the top of my list of threats to women's equality. As far as my legal practice goes, the internet is a wild west where anonymity and lack of regulation have given misogyny a powerful platform. Recent Office of National Statistics data show that one in three UK women, 36%, have experienced online abuse or harassment on social media. Four in five online grooming cases last year were against girls. 90% of girls in secondary schools say they've received dick pics or other unwanted sexual content. So many times, women whose intimate images have been posted online can do nothing. The police aren't interested in trying to pierce anonymity or go after a perp in a different jurisdiction. The internet companies won't bother taking down the image and often don't even respond to requests especially the, the gigantic porn companies. It's hard to even know who to sue. Sometimes they're in the wrong jurisdiction and getting judgment is hard and they're judgment proof. I commend those involved in passing the online harms bill, which is a big step in the right direction. It regulates deep fakes. It criminalizes the threat to share intimate images. It means victims no longer need to prove the person who shared their intimate image at an intent to cause them distress. This is assumed. But it does not rank violence against women at the highest level. A code of practice already drawn up by distinguished experts commissioned by End Violence Against Women sets out a workable framework for internet companies to regulate this kind of harmful speech, and it should be included in future amendments. Meanwhile, I have a small but untargeted suggestion for a simple shift of default position with respect to image-based abuse. Why not require any intimate image being posted online to be accompanied by a video declaration from the person depicted, displaying the government ID, theirs, authorizing its use. Websites that violate this could be fined for repeat offenders, banned from accessing the internet in the UK the way child porn sites are. And victims of image-based abuse ought to have an automatic right to get search engines like Google and Bing to delink them from their search results so the images don't follow someone around for the rest of their lives, hurting their employment prospects and their family life. It is clear from the range of problems I've discussed and the difficulty of existing laws in reaching them that the rule of law must be conceived in a more comprehensive way than simply doing right by the people who show up in the courtroom, important though that is. Women's equality, women's inequality, has been the norm for most of human history. So of course it is deeply embedded in our institutions. How might we use law to paraphrase Tony Blair, not only to be tough on misogyny, but tough on the causes of misogyny? I think I followed Tom Sargent in thinking that almost no murder, no rape, no groping on a bus, no posting a former girlfriend's intimate picture online uh, appears from the blue but rather reflects a lifetime of choices and influences that are in our power over time to tilt in a better direction for future generations. At the sharp end of the legal system, one reform I think deserves consideration is specialized courts for sexual offenses. In New Zealand and South Africa, a specialist court pilot has had positive results 
and this is now being considered in Scotland. The basic features should include dedicated judges, control of cross-examination to prevent shaming the victim, trauma-informed training for all staff, firm trial dates, as well as features for the comfort and safety of complainants, like areas to wait with families separated from the accused. Even before separate courts are created, there is room right away to have specialist officers able to counsel victims and shepherd them through the system. Research in both the US and UK shows that they make a big difference in giving women confidence to make complaints and then to stick with them through the vicissitudes of a criminal prosecution. Also on the sharp end of helping women deal with rape and sexual abuse is combating a seriously worrisome recent trend of perpetrators suing women who complain for defamation. In November 2020, Mr. Justice Nicole found in a carefully reasoned high court judgment that Johnny Depp assaulted his wife Amber Heard a dozen times and put her in fear for her life three times, and the Court of Appeals denied leave to appeal. In America, Depp sued Heard for defamation simply for saying in an op-ed that she knew something about domestic abuse. The case became a media circus, and against the odds and against the truth, he won, having spent literally millions on social media bots attacking her reputation, which indeed has been dragged through the gutter. I have to say that a lot of men I meet at dinner parties or on airplanes feel Depp has struck an important blow for men's rights. And in my practice, I have seen many more threats of defamation against women by their abusers than I used to. The debate here about anti-slap suits in commercial contexts shows how pernicious the threat of well-financed defamation cases can be in shutting people up, shutting women up, who have important things to say that, that the public should know. California has just passed a useful law seeking to curb this type of abuse. It declares that a communication made by an individual without malice regarding an incident of sexual assault, harassment, or discrimination is privileged for defamation purposes and so cannot form the basis of a defamation suit. It protects only those who have a reasonable basis to file a complaint of sexual assault, harassment, or, or discrimination, whether the complaint is or was filed or not. That requirement of a reasonable basis means that anyone who does invent a claim of abuse can still get sued for defamation. But if the person you publicly call your abuser then sues you for defamation and you prevail, you get attorney's fees and treble damages. I think this is an excellent reform that should be adopted in England too. With this sort of protection, women who took years before they had the courage to describe attacks by Jimmy Savile or Russell Brand or Harvey Weinstein or Jeffrey Epstein or Prince Andrew would not have faced the prospect of being destroyed in the way that defamation lawyers in this country are extremely adept at doing. Beyond this, in terms of curbing the sources of misogyny, what might we do? Over the long term, the law can help change attitudes as well as behavior. I draw a lot of inspiration from Scandinavia and Iceland, where they are ahead of us in daily equality of women. A crucial reform is recasting social expectations of who earns the bread and who stays at home. When a child is born, the mother gets maternity leave, only if the dad takes it on an equal amount and the state makes sure the amount is generous. So everyone takes it, usually a whole year. This sets a firm basis for men and women, boys and girls, finding each other members of the same species rather than strangers who can be seen as less than full human beings. They have excellent sex and relationship education that focuses on seeing boys, girls, and everyone in between as people, people who matter and have rights, no matter how raging your hormones or how great your alcohol consumption. They do not question the right to abortion, which I point out is still illegal in this country. Two doctors must agree the woman would suffer mentally before it is legally permitted, rather than its being an automatic right. They have excellent childcare and elder care systems fueled by high taxes that mean women really can have careers and a full life, a chance to realize their gifts, a chance to express their full potential. Hillary Clinton made a splash in Beijing 30 years ago by declaring women's rights are human rights. 
Recent events have made me think about inverting this proposition. On the most fundamental level, our greatest fear about women being knocked off the path to equality are fears about the health, the survival of a liberal world order. The kind of democracy I took as my birthright and then after the collapse of communism seemed to hold on in the march is not in full retreat, but is certainly under threat. In the country of my birth, a big part of the population gives fealty to someone who tried to overthrow two centuries of a constitutional republic and came damn near succeeding. He told more than 30,000 lies as president. He is contempt for any rule except what helps him in that moment. He has allies, wannabes, all over the globe, from Orban and Erdogan to Putin and Duarte, Xi and Bolsonaro, and a host of lesser strongmen. I use the word strongmen on purpose. These proponents of one-man rule take the man part very seriously. They glorify violence, ride their horses shirtless, grab pussies, and also fight sex education and abortion rights and shelters for domestic abuse victims. They want their women to be strippers or at home making babies and not much else. Decisions by the testosterone charged who shut out dissent turn out to be flawed. I thought we as a species might've learned that from Hitler and Mussolini and Stalin, but in the present day, lots of bad ideas are rising to the top in an echo chamber of bro culture. I include invading Ukraine, drinking bleach to fight COVID, energizing mobs to attack the US Capitol and the Brazilian Congress, and also Elon Musk, both buying Twitter for way too much money and then sending its content moderation, getting ending its content moderation so that in our firm, our social media director calls Twitter a river of shit. I was struck by coverage of the COVID inquiry last week, which showed Boris Johnson and Dominic Cummings were making bad decisions because they acted like masters of the universe. Of the female deputy cabinet secretary, Cummings texted, I would personally handcuff her and escort her from the building. I don't care how it is done, but that woman must be out of our hair. We cannot keep dealing with this horrific meltdown of the British state while dodging stilettos from that cunt. Susie Flintham, spokesman for COVID-19 Bereaved Families for Justice, summed this up. The nastiness, arrogance, and misogyny at the heart of government during the pandemic is core to the awful decision-making that led to thousands of unnecessary deaths and tore families like mine apart. The style of decision-making prevailing in, November, in number 10 during COVID was a WhatsApp frat boy perversion of the British constitution. It's a trend. On both sides of the Atlantic, we see frightening evidence that what we thought were strong and enduring institutions can hollow out very quickly under those cultural pressures. The most succinct expression of the British constitution is the good chaps theory. Don't worry about the fine points of textual exegesis. You let sound, if you let sound fellows run things. Now we see what happens when the chaps don't feel bound by customary rules. The rule-free chaps are getting, they dominate in Silicon Valley and are amassing the power that comes with huge wealth and products that reach into every phone. They have fanboys and political allies that Andrew Tate and Donald Trump and Dominic Cummings have been making the cultural and political weather is a warning that the latest technology is perversely connecting with an ancient instinct to follow the man with the biggest club. Unchecked, that trend will undermine from within the rights of women we have fought for and all the freedoms our way of life depends on. I will continue to focus my professional life on advancing women's rights through law, but I end by saying we all must do what we can to invest in our democratic institutions. Personally, I would replace first past the post with the form of proportional representation to strengthen parliament's legitimacy and give more diverse voices a hearing at Westminster. I hope one of the parties in a future coalition government will be the Women's Equality Party, of which I'm a proud founding member. I would make voting compulsory too. To me, it is a sacred obligation, which our ancestors fought and died to preserve. You may have other ideas for rejuvenating our democracy, but I think history shows that women's rights and human rights are indivisible. The advancement of women to full equality will not be possible if the rule of law is shredded by the authoritarians 
now using the rocket fuel of social media to turn the clock back and glorify violence against women. Women and men alike have an interest in stopping them and in regaining the initiative. A world where women's rights are strongly entrenched will be safer, better, and more just for everyone, for men as well as women. Thank you. Thank you, um, Anne, for this, uh, for, for the wide ranging, and if I might say, hard hitting uh, lecture that you've, you've just presented. And thank you for sharing your your own story, something so personal, and to use this horrendous experience to enable other women uh, to speak out, however difficult it must be for you to talk about it, and for others, particularly uh, those who may have suffered something similar to, to listen. Um, if we want to tackle these systemic issues, one of the within our, our, our legal within our justice system, one of the key messages I've heard from you is is how vital it is to listen carefully to the evidence, including the compelling, if I if I might say so, um, empirical evidence um, that you have um, provided us as with, um, so that we might um, ensure that these issues um, I, 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 we might consider these issues and how we might play a part in bringing about positive uh, change. And thank you on that note for the uh, ranging recommendations. Um, that you have uh, presented. Thank you also for citing um, the, uh, our own report on, on prosecuting sexual offences. Um, uh, and I was struck by the powerful introduction um, and, and anchoring that you gave to the, to the rule of law, uh, another a topic of, of a landmark report that, that Justice uh, published in September. And may I commend that to you, our audience, um, if you have not already read them. Uh, but Anne, may I say a, a, a final thank you um, and offer a virtual applause, which is a, a, a very small way to recognise your, your highly impactful uh, lecture. Thank you very much indeed.